Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at First Logan on this beautiful and glorious day. We are so glad that we have come together in person and virtually on Facebook Live and later on YouTube to give thanks and praise to God for this wonderful, wonderful day. We have a number of announcements this morning and first up is Dave Coons. Good morning. I have uh, two announcements from committees. The first one is from the personnel committee. And as some of you know, we have a new office manager. Her name is Janet, is it Cougar? Coger? Coger, like Coger. Coger, C-O-G-A-R. Janet started on Tuesday and uh, she'll be in the office every day of the week, uh, Monday through Friday. And the new hours for the office will be 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So Janet is a um, uh, very wonderful gal and um, uh, friendly, um, compassionate, and she's worked in a church office before. She manages, managed a church office some years ago. Um, she's a little bit overwhelmed to learning all the, our ways of doing things. So. But if you, uh, if you call the church office and uh, Janet will answer, welcome her to our church family. Or if you stop by the church, take time to go into the office and say hi to her and meet her. I'm sure she's not going to remember your name right away, but we'll get there. And, um, but we're, we're excited about it, and she is thrilled to, uh, to be a part of this church family now, too. So. Uh, the second announcement is from the mission committee. Uh, as you know, we've... Um, we haven't been doing the community meal because of the pandemic situation, and, and we were, were anxious to do it, and we uh, attempted to do it a couple of months ago. We were going to do it in-house, the regular way, in the Westminster room, but uh, the COVID um, um, virus came back, and we felt it was not, we couldn't responsibly have that number of people in the Westminster room eating a meal together. So the idea was hatched that we do a drive-through or a grab-and-go type thing. And that takes quite a bit of planning, quite a bit of logistics, and uh, so by, we think we're there. So we're going to do it on September 23rd. A Thursday night, September 23rd, we'll have the community meal. It will be a grab-and-go type thing. We, will, um, we have these uh, containers that we're going to put the meals in. There's uh, three compartments, and we'll just hand these out. We'll have tables outside the Westminster room and hand them into the cars as they pass or if people walk up and take them. And um, um, it'll be quite a bit of work, so we're, we're asking for help, obviously. And uh, the menu is, we're taking a page out of Burt Greenan's cookbook, and we're doing um, spiral ham, green beans, and baked, uh, baked uh, mac and cheese. <laughs> almost forgot, macaroni and cheese. So, and also cornbread, and then we'll have desserts, just cookies or brownies. So the church is gonna handle the ham and the baked beans. We need volunteers to bake the um, uh, mac and cheese and also the cornbread, and then to make some cookies for us. So I've got some sign-up sheets here. I'll leave them out in the entryway there, and I'll leave one down at Westminster. If you can help with any of that, we also need half a dozen people to help put the meals together and to serve them. So um, uh, if you would sign up, please put your name and a contact information, either a email or a phone number, and then we'll remind you what to do and, and when to have the stuff here and so forth. And if you don't sign up now, you can call the office. Janet will have these sheets and you, she can sign you up. And uh, we appreciate your support on this. So if you have any questions, let me or Rick Waller uh, from the Mission Committee know. And by the way, quick note, Mission Committee is looking for new members, so if you're willing to serve on that, especially, especially women, we don't have a single woman on the Mission Committee, which makes no sense to me, but um, so if anybody is interested, see myself or Rick. Thank you. Now that we're all hungry, 
That was a great menu. That's wonderful. Uh, I also want to remind you that um, next Sunday is our 192nd birthday celebration. Again, we don't look a day over 100. Uh, we will be gathering at the Bowen House on the grounds. Uh, bring a chair if you want to be on the ground. You can bring a blanket. Bring your lunch. We will have dessert, uh, something like a birthday cake. Uh, we will have um, a wonderful worship service. And then we will have um, lunch and fellowship together to celebrate the life and ministry of this church for more than 192 years. How exciting is that? I also want to let you know that I received word uh, this morning that Susan Barron's husband, Chuck, died suddenly this morning of a massive heart attack. So as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God, let us surround Susan and the children and the family in prayer and thanksgiving for the wonderful life that Chuck has had and for the promise of eternal life that he has now. Let us go to God and let us worship God. morning. Please stand for the call to worship. 
This is a place of thanksgiving. We rejoice. This is a time to bring praise and prayer to God. These are the friends who have become our church family. This is the Christ who goes ahead to challenge us. Let us worship God. Please join me in hymn 708. God of all creation, we live each day because of your grace. Hear our confession as we recognize the many ways we fell short of your intentions. Forgive us for choosing to love those who are dressed like us, speak like us, share our experiences and way of living. We speak of our commitment to you, but act in ways that deny you. Show us your grace and mercy that is beyond our understanding. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. Rejoice and be glad. Our God is full of mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Dare to believe in the gift of a new beginning and be at peace. Please share the peace of Christ and also with you. in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Please be seated Let's join together in the prayer for illumination Free our troubled hearts O God, and reveal to us your marvelous light. Guide us by your truth and lead us to a new life. Amen.
The first scripture reading is from the second chapter of James, verses 14 through 17. My friends, what good is it to say you have faith when you don't have anything to show that you really do have faith? Can that kind of faith save you? If you know someone who doesn't have any clothes or food, you shouldn't just say, I hope all goes well. I hope all goes well for you. I hope you will be warm and have plenty to eat. What good is it to say this unless you do something to help? Faith that doesn't lead us to good deeds is all alone and dead. The second reading is from 7th chapter of Mark, 24 through 30. Jesus left and went to the region near the city of Tyre, where he stayed in someone's home. He did not want people to know he was there, but they found out anyway. A woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard where Jesus was, and right away she came and knelt down at his feet. The woman was Greek and had been born in the part of Syria known as Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to force the demon out of her daughter, but Jesus said, the children must be fed first. The children must first be fed. It isn't right to take away their food and feed it to the dogs. The woman replied, Lord, even dogs eat the crumbs that children drop from the table. Jesus answered, that's true. You may go now. The demon has left your daughter. When the woman got back home, she found her child laying in bed. The demon had gone. There are just a few things that I truly dread doing things that I'll put off as long as I possibly can. I bet y'all know what I'm talking about. We all have our list of the dreaded to-dos. My list includes trying on and buying a swimsuit. I wear the same one I bought online from Land's Inn six years ago. It's in very good condition because I hardly ever wear it. I don't like to throw away old papers. I didn't throw away my uh, law school papers until 2007. I graduated from law school in 1983. You can do the math. And I just can't stand doing my annual tax return. Even with a CPA, I hate doing them. And yes, I have until October 15th to file my 2020 tax return. But the most dreaded of all of the dreadful to-dos is the awkward DTR of dating. Do any of you know what DTR stands for? Define the relationship. This is the official talk that takes place at some point in a romantic relationship to determine the level of commitment. You want to see where things stand and find out if what you have is real. And if the couple is of a certain age, let's say very mature, it comes earlier in the relationship rather than later because you don't have that much time to waste. So you really need to know if this is going anywhere. Regardless of the maturity of the couple, there comes a time when you need to define the relationship. You need to intentionally evaluate the state of the relationship and your level of commitment to the person. And yes, it can be awkward. And yes, it can be very uncomfortable, but eventually every healthy relationship reaches a point where the DTR is needed. Is it casual or is it committed? Have things moved past infatuation and admiration and towards a deeper devotion and dedication? 
Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus, opens with this exercise. And I want you to do this exercise with me and know it doesn't involve getting our heart rate up. Okay, so here's what I wanna ask you to do. Picture yourself walking into a local coffee shop or M&M Diner or McDonald's, okay? You grab a snack and get a drink, and perhaps that's an iced tea with extra ice like I would get. And then you walk towards the back where it isn't so crowded and you feel comfortable taking your mask off. You take a sip of your drink and you enjoy a few quiet minutes. Now imagine that Jesus comes in and sits down next to you. You know it's him because he looks just like the stained glass window. But you're unsure what to say. In an awkward moment, you try to break the silence by asking him to turn your drink into wine. He gives you the same look he used to give Peter. And before he has a chance to respond, you suddenly realize you haven't prayed for your food. You decide to say your prayer out loud, hoping that Jesus will be impressed. You start off okay, but understandably you get nervous and you pray. Three things we pray, to love thee more dearly, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee oh, more nearly day by day by day. And you quickly say amen. And you realize you're quoting the actor Ben Stiller's prayer from the movie Meet the Parents. Before you have a chance to make things even more awkward, Jesus skips past the small talk and gets right to the point. He looks you in the eye and says, it's time we define this relationship. He wants to know how you feel about him. Is your relationship with Jesus exclusive? Is it just a casual weekend thing? Or has it moved past that? How would your relationship with him be defined? What exactly is your level of commitment? Whether you've called yourself a Christian since childhood or all of this is new to you, Jesus would clearly define what kind of relationship he wants to have with you. He wouldn't sugarcoat it or dress it up. He would tell you exactly what it means to follow him. And as you're sitting in that coffee shop or the M&M diner or the back of McDonald's, listening to Jesus give you the unedited version of what kind of relationship he wants with you, I can't help but wonder if the real question is, are you a follower? of Jesus? That's a little bit more challenging to answer. There's a tendency to define yourself as a follower based on how you feel about Jesus, but following requires there to be more than a feeling. Following requires movement, for faith is more than a feeling. James concludes verse 17 this way. Faith by itself, if it isn't accompanied by action, is dead. I'm going to say that again. Faith by itself, if it isn't accompanied by action, is dead. Today's text is a DTR text for each one of us. It defines what kind of relationship we are to have with God. It clearly, unequivocally, and with great precision tells us that the faith in which we are justified by God mandates a response, a way of living. Through God's grace, we become more godly. Our faith becomes stronger and our lives are transformed. 
we live with a difference. Faith in Jesus Christ is life-changing. And if our lives are not changed, if we do not live with a difference, then as James so bluntly puts it, our faith is dead. Chuck Swindoll, in one of the books that he wrote, gives, I think, a memorable illustration of this. And this is what he said. Okay, let's pretend that you work for me. That's Chuck talking, not me. In fact, you are my executive assistant in a company that is growing rapidly. I'm the owner and I'm interested in expanding overseas and into new markets. To pull this off, I make plans to travel abroad and stay there until the new branch office gets established. I make all the arrangements to take my family on the move to Europe for six to eight months. And I leave you in charge of the busy stateside organization. I tell you that I will write you regularly and give you direction and instructions. I leave, you stay. Months pass. A flow of letters are mailed from Europe and received by you at the national headquarters. I spell out my expectations. And then finally, after about nine months, I return. Soon after my arrival, I decide to drive down to the office. I'm stunned. Grass and weeds have grown up high. A few windows along the street are broken. I walk into the receptionist room and she is doing her nails, chewing gum, and listening to her favorite hip hop station. I look around and notice the wastebaskets are overflowing, the carpet hasn't been vacuumed in weeks, and nobody seems concerned that the owner has returned. I ask for you and someone in the crowded lounge area points down the hall and yells, I think he's down there. Disturbed, I move in that direction and bump into you as you are finishing a chess game with our sales manager. I ask you to step into my office, which by the way has been turned into a video game room. What in the world's going on here, man? What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, look at this place. Didn't you get my letters? Letters? Oh yeah, sure. We got every one of them. And as a matter of fact, we have a letter study every Friday night since you left. We even divide everybody into small groups and discuss many of the things you wrote. And you know, some of those things are really interesting. You'll be pleased to know that a few of us have actually committed to memory some of your sentences and paragraphs. And one or two have even memorized an entire letter or two. Great stuff in those letters. Okay, okay, you got my letters, you studied them, you meditated on them, discussed them, and even memorized them. But what did you do about them? Do? Huh? We didn't do anything about them. Faith, says Frederick Beekner is distinctly different from other aspects of religious life and not to be confused with them even though we sometimes use the word to mean religious belief in general. Faith is different than theology because theology is reasons, systematic and orderly, whereas faith is disorderly, intermittent, and full of surprises. Faith is different from mysticism because mystics in their ecstasy become one with that faith and can at most see only from afar. Faith is different from ethics because ethics is primarily concerned not with, like faith, with our relationship to God, but with our relationship to each other. 
Faith, I think, is closest perhaps to worship because like worship, it's essentially a response to God and involves the emotions and the physical senses and action as well as the mind. But worship is usually consistent, and if you're Presbyterian, it is decent and in order and structured and single-minded and seems to know what it's doing, while faith is a stranger, an exile on earth, and doesn't know for certain about anything. Well, that's all fine and good, Pastor Diane, but what is faith? Hmm. Faith is a yearning. Faith is a homesickness. Faith is a lump in the throat. Faith is less a position on than a movement toward, less a sure thing than a hunch. Faith is a journey through space and through time. And how do we live out our faith? Faith as faithfulness to God and trust in God is the product of a deeper and deeper centering in God. Faithfulness leads us to pay attention to our relationship with God. And through that attention, we become even more deeply centered in God. Trust is the fruit of that deeper centering. This trust in God grows and grows as God moves us to faith-filled works, acts of kindness, leaps into the unknown. A church work day, community meals, card making, intercessory prayers, book study, fellowship, youth on a mission, Good Samaritan Fund, emergency assistant, food pantry, Bowen House, outreach ministries, men's group, koinonia, Bible studies, PB&J sandwiches, school supplies, special music, ice cream socials, scouting, worshiping, singing, gardening, cleaning, painting, repair work, artwork, banner making, ushering, greeting, talking to friends, talking to strangers, loving ourselves and loving our neighbors. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal, hope your day is blessed? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs. In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. DTR, define the relationship. It's just you and Jesus sitting at a table defining the relationship. Defining the relationship. Amen. Let us stand and affirm what we believe using the affirmation of faith as printed in your order of worship. Christ elects the church to proclaim the word and celebrate the sacraments, to worship God's name, and to live as true disciples. He creates this community to be a place of prayer, to provide rest for the weary, and to lead people to share in service. The Holy Spirit sends the church to call sinners to repentance, 
to proclaim the good news that Jesus is personal Savior and Lord. The Spirit sends the church out in ministry to preach good news to the poor, righteousness to the nations, and peace among all people. The Holy Spirit builds one church united in one Lord and one hope with one ministry around one table. Amen.
Please be seated. Lord, you show us love's true measure. Let us return that true measure to God with our tithes and offerings. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, today's scripture reminds us that words matter and that the way we choose our words holds within it the capacity to either harm or heal, to wound or welcome. In this time when words are tossed around so casually, may our words be used to build up the body of Christ and share love and compassion in a broken and battered world. Healing God, we pray for those who have been hurt by words of late, for refugees and immigrants with or without documentation, for women and girls who have endured words of sexism, for people of color who hear words of racism, for people with disabilities who are told they are less than, for elderly people who are told they are useless, for young adults who are told they are entitled, selfish, and irresponsible. God of the living word, help us speak the truth in love and to care for one another with the words we choose to speak. God of healing and wholeness, we lift up to you our words of prayer for the people near and dear to our hearts as we lift them up silently before you now.
triune God. We love you for you hear our voice and our supplications. We lift these prayers to your ears along with the prayer you taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is one of my favorite hymns. It's Song of Hope. It's a wonderful, peppy little tune. Um, we're going to sing it three, time, three times. Uh, Susan's going to play it for us once, and then we'll sing it three times. And it moves a little quickly, but I think you will really enjoy it, and the text is marvelous. So let us stand and listen to Susan play the hymn, and then we will sing it three times. the God of hope go with us every day. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father Almighty and as you go remember by the goodness of God you were born into this world. By the grace of God you have been kept all the day long even until this very moment. And by the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ you are being redeemed. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.